Oh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to day three of our deep dive training into all things Wavefront. Just to reiterate, or for anyone that maybe didn't join for the first couple of days, my name is Connor Beverland, part of the customer success team at Wavefront, and really happy and excited for Cloud Health and, and anyone else who may watch this video in the future to be onboarding with Wavefront and starting to, to use it. What we're going to be covering today is kind of like the end user experience of Wavefront, how to work with dashboards, how to work with charts, how to edit those things. We will also look at how you can control access to those dashboards by default in Wavefront. And to, to a certain extent, I think almost the, the original intent of Wavefront is that everything is open to everybody. Um, bit of the concept of trying to share information across an organization. But we do have access control that allows you to limit who can view which dashboards and you can, who can edit which, which dashboards. And we will be looking at that as well. The first thing I'm going to do is just review the, the exercises from yesterday's session and the answers to those and see if there are any questions about that or anything else from any of the prior sessions. And then we'll get into today's content. And just as a reminder, the, the final session tomorrow is going to be kind of around really monitoring with Wavefront. So looking at how you do alerting and, and how you do, how events appear in the system. Okay, so here's the, both the answers, but also the questions reiterated. Um, when I sent the answers out into the channel yesterday, I actually did not use the query builder for any of them. But I realized that for several of them, you don't need to type the query language. The query builder will actually do the job. So I, I used the query builder for those ones uh, in what I'm showing here. First question was just calculate the average request latency, but broken out by environment or group by environment. And all of these questions, by the way, all worked around this sample data that we've been looking at quite a bit during the session as we're learning about how to do queries. So in this case, it's pretty straightforward. You find the metric that that is request latency, and we have it here. There's no filters. In fact, I think for none of for any of these questions, we didn't need to filter the data. But if you did need to, this is where you would do it. And in this case, we do an average of the data and we choose to group by the environment tag. And that gives us the result of all of the data averaged out, broken out by production and development. Question two was around calculating remaining disk space when you don't have a metric for remaining disk space. Oh, or actually, I, I misspoke. There is a filter in this one. So this was for all database machines. And here, what we've done is just get the total disk space filtered down to machines that are beginning with DB. So DB and then asterisk will match all the DBs. And you can see in the legend here, we have a bunch of DB-1, DB-2, and so on listed out. And then simply subtract from that the, di the, u the disk space that the same DBs are using. Next was identify the top five systems with the current highest memory used percentage. All that is is find the right metric, no filters in this case, and apply the top K function to it. The question was just to do it with the current highest memory usage, and so that's just top K with no special or optional arguments. But if you wish to do you could do things like me, what was the first version? And then the fourth one was the trickiest one. I kind of shown two different ways to approach it or to approach the concept. Um, the se I guess the second one is my own personal view of how I, th I tend to think about these kind of things. Uh, this is quote unquote, the standard answer. Um, the, and the question is, Calculate 
the number of request failures that occurred in the prior 24 hour period, but show, show that result as just a single data point every 24 hours. And I think the question might even have said in central time. And so if you want to do that daily in, in US central time, the way to do it is to use the hour function, filter that to where it's, it's zero, which is midnight. And we're obviously specifying that it's in the central time zone here. And then say, show the result of this query at midnight each day. And the query itself is pretty straightforward. We are adding up or summing up all of the failures that happened across all our systems. And then we're summing up all those total failures over a full day. And if I switch this to a point plot and we're looking at it on, in eight days here, we can see how we have data points at each, every 24 hours and they happen <clears> to <throat> midnight in US central time. When I read this question for myself, the way that I immediately think of it and the way I think of if I want to have data at certain intervals in general, whether it be every five minutes, every day, every week, I always think of a line. And the difference in this case though is that a line is going to be align, aligning these days to the UTC as opposed to central time. Uh, but maybe that's actually okay. You know, as everyone around the world is more and more working with colleagues from all over the place in different time zones, maybe we should all be mostly thinking in UTC when we're communicating with each other to help each other out. But the other nice thing about doing this with a line is that it works just fine with the query builder. You don't need any to type any query directly. You can just chain these functions together. And of course, with the query builder, if you do want to see the underlying wavefront query, you can always just click that little to chart builder icon and see that. Something that's a little, a little tricky or complicated, but it may be worth knowing. Align and moving functions do work slightly differently, which is why in the uh, align example here, we are aligning to the first point every day. The reason for this is that moving functions are continuously showing you at each time slice, the value for the time window backwards. So like moving sum of one day here is summing up all of the values for the prior one day backwards in time or left through the chart. With a line on the other hand, when you align to a certain time period, you get a, a data point at, at that interval. The value at each data point is looking forward across the, the full number uh, uh, or the full width of the time window that you specified. So it's kind of going in the opposite direction of a moving function. And for that reason, we are aligning here to the first value, like what was the point right here, which is going to match the, the moving sum going backwards. The extra credit question then was around this concept of gap threshold question is why do we have these dashed lines here? The reason is that ordinarily this data is being reported every one minute and therefore is being shown as a solid line. In this time period, the data is missing for, for several minutes and therefore it's, it's reporting less frequently than every minute or every 60 seconds. And therefore it's shown as a dashed line between the data. The, the threshold to configure that is controlled via gap threshold. And the idea about it is to give you a visual cue of, of something like this, where normally the data is reporting on a certain interval and it's just highlighting to me, oh, something must have happened in the middle of this chart. If you're seeing data where the, the lines are all dashed. That is probably just an indication that you want to configure the gap threshold for this data for what its expected interval is. So that 
you're not seeing those dashed lines. Like if perhaps the expected interval here was every five minutes, I could put 300 here and I no longer see those dashes. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, just any questions about any of that? So if you set the gap threshold higher than what the, the actual gap is, that's okay too? That's fine too, yeah. If you don't, yeah, like it can be useful. And I think in, in the original case here, th this is a case where that probably would be useful if I was looking at this data and I just quickly know, oops, something happened here. Um, but if you don't care about it, you can, you can literally just set it to some really high number and just have your, your data showing solidly. Okay, so now we're going to look at dashboarding and charting in some detail. Uh, obviously, a lot of this stuff is just point and click and you can figure it out. In fact, hopefully most of it is that way. Um, if we get the UX right, it should all be fairly self-evident. But that said, it will hopefully show you some tips and tricks here and things that you may not have realized that can help you make uh, good use of Wavefront and help you be able to troubleshoot issues and find problems with Wavefront maybe a little quicker than, than you could have otherwise. In the slide deck, we've got a few slides that are, and we'll do this for charts as well as dashboards, that are just highlighting the key concepts. I'm not gonna spend time on this because we'll be looking at, at some real dashboards in the product itself. These are mostly just here for your reference uh, after the session if you want to, to refer back to them. I will mention, the, I will show these, or I plan to show these um, live as well, but I will mention these just in case I forget so that you've seen them. The, these are probably one of the more you know, tips and tricks things where they're not immediately discoverable if you don't know about them. Um, and the, the shift key one, in fact, came up yesterday uh, for, in a question. If you're looking at data in a chart or a dashboard and you want to see the original raw data, like Wavefront's going to try and summarize the values for you so that if you have some really large numbers, they're not going to take up 20 or 30 characters on your screen to show the full number. Sometimes you might want to see the true, real, big number hold on the shift key while you're hovering over the legend and it will show you that. Um, and we'll also see that the shift key allows you to quickly zoom all charts into the same time period in, in one go. The control key or command key on a Mac um, will stop the legend from appearing. So if the legend's kind of getting in your way of trying to, trying to look at some data uh, you can just hold control to remove it. And there's also an ability which I'll show to um, click on lines or time series in charts in a dashboard to highlight them across all the charts that are using that, you know, they're coming from that same source. And you can hold on con command or control to select multiple of those. Okay, let's take a look at some of this stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll go over to Cloud Health, but again, most of what I'm going to show can also be done on, on VMware. Probably actually all of it can be done on the VMware cluster. So if you want to follow along, please do so. Um, we're going to start by looking at just the, the dashboard organizer and how you find dashboards. You will notice if you have not got any favorite dashboards yet, you might not see this or you at least it might be an empty list. One of the first things I'll point out is how you can make some dashboards be your favorites. It just makes a very quick, easy way for you to come into Wavefront, open up the menu, get to the dashboard you want to get to. The dashboard organizer does two things, essentially. Mainly, it's the thing that you go to to find the dashboard that you're looking for, searching for them. But it also lets you add tags to the dashboards, which can help make it easier for other, either yourself or for others to find the dashboards that you're making. The 
the tagging works as follows. Maybe I'll show that first. Or Well, first, actually, I said I'll show the favorites first. Very simple. Find the dashboard that you want and just click the little favor icon. Whether, whether you find it because it's in the list in front of you or you've searched for it or you've filtered down to a, a tag or a tag path, just click here to favorite it. Once you have favorited something, as well as appearing in this menu for you, they will always then also appear just at the top of the list when you come into the dashboard organizer. Adding tags to things is very simple. Um, I'll find, for instance, a dashboard here. I can either select multiple and add tags, or indeed remove tags, or on an individual dashboard, I can click the little plus icon. If you provide a tag name that has just, that has no dot characters in it, it will become a tag and it will just appear in this list of tags, which is searchable. And you can click any of these to filter it onto that list. The tag path concept though is if you put dots in your tag names, you're able to form hierarchies of these things. I think this is pretty useful. Um, and I believe if I'm remembering correctly, there was even a conversation with some of the cloud health users on Slack this week around, it probably would be a good idea for teams within cloud health to tag the dashboards to make it easier for teams to find their stuff. And I think doing that with tag paths uh, can help because then it makes it easy for people to drill into their one. Um, I'll reuse an existing one here just by way of example. So let's say I'm going to put this into the Wavefront training dashboards grouping. From there, though, if I, if I want to make a new tag, I can. It's very simple to do so. Now, if I open up the tag path, I can either, I can click, by the way, just at the top level. This will show me all of them. Or I can click into any level of this hierarchy and see the dashboards with those tags. In this case, we gave it the training wavefront wf.training.dashboards and show it shows up here. Also very easy to remove these tags. And of course, like everything else in Wavefront, it's all just calling APIs under the covers. We looked at the the API documentation for Wavefront on day one. So if you wanted if you were mass adding a whole bunch of tags to a whole bunch of dashboards, you can do that programmatically. You don't have to, to point and click through the the UI like this. There's various ways that you can search in here. The thing that I find I use a lot is just looking for the popular dashboards. I, I, this may come from the fact that I'm working with different customers and it can be helpful for me to see, you know, which dashboards are they, are they using a lot. So popular dashboards is a quick way to just see which are the ones that were viewed the most over the past week. There are other ways that you can sort this data. You can sort in the la you know, views by different ways, but also other concepts and look for them up and down. I mean, another perhaps useful thing, especially as your usage of Wavefront continues is look for the ones that are not viewed much. There's no real issue from a Wavefront standpoint with having hundreds or even thousands of dashboards. Um, so the fact that there are, you may have dashboards that are no longer used doesn't actually hurt anything, except it may um, make it a little harder for people to find the dashboards that are actually current and relevant and useful. So if, you've, if you want to declutter over time, just looking for the ones that, that aren't used is a pretty good way of doing that. Okay, so let's let's look at an actual dashboard <laughs> and see some things about how that works. I'm gonna, so this is one that is a favorite of mine. I'm gonna see if I can just find it by searching though. So, because I hadn't shown an example of just how do you search. You'll see that as you enter text into the search box, it's actually looking for lots of different things for you. This is not just searching the dashboard name, 
this is searching content of the dashboard as well. Um, and it's highlighting which pieces of the dashboard content it is finding the uh, this data in. And you can then narrow that search down by that. In this case, I'm looking for the, the name, wavefront usage, and proxy metrics. But this can be handy if you're trying to see like, oh, I, I care about metrics related to Nginx. So I, I can search here and find the dashboards that have Nginx metrics on them. All right. This is actually a useful dashboard for you to know about in general anyway. This is one of the dashboards that comes with Wavefront out of the box. This is showing you a lot of information about the the use of way, like the data rate that you're sending into Wavefront, also the health of your proxies uh, and what's going on with them. So useful dashboard to get to know, especially if you're one of the folks at Cloud Health who would be um, troubleshooting things like how much data are you sending into Wavefront? Uh, are the are the proxies blocking any data? Which they are actually a little bit, not a, not a whole lot very tiny percentage compared to your overall rate, but there's something non-zero there. Um, you'll notice that dashboards lazy load as I scroll through. So you, you can have dashboards with hundreds of charts on them. That's not a problem. Um, we won't attempt to load the entire dashboard in one go. We'll load it as you scroll. Obviously, if you have a large dashboard, you don't necessarily want to have to scroll all the way to the bottom of it to find what you're looking for. <laughs> so we have this concept of sections. Dashboard can be chunked up into logical groupings, logical sections. And then there's this button at the top, jump to, which makes it easy to jump to that part that you care about. So if I jump down here, this is kind of cool, actually. You can see quite a number of users logged into Wavefront in, uh, within Cloud Health recently and this this actually this chart may need modification this may include all the pre-built integrations although you probably do actually have a lot of dashboards that you imported from datadog which may account for <laughs> a large number another just to highlight if you another way that you can favorite a dashboard is if you're looking at something and it's useful you want to favorite it there's just a little icon right there to do it. Let me put this back into live mode. By default, when you open a dashboard, it is going to be live and it's going to be showing you data over the past two hours. It's actually possible when you're editing dashboards to configure this. Like there may be certain dashboards where you really have to be looking at it over a week or over a day or something for it to make sense. And for those dashboards, you can set their default time window to be whatever you need. But if you don't customize anything, you, you land on a dashboard, it's going to be two hours. You'll see that there's this little kind of time ticker here. The dashboard is going to refresh itself automatically every 30 seconds. If you need to, you can just click that little um, circular thing to make it refresh right now. If I click the time box here, there's a bunch of pre-built um, time windows where you can look at. Most of these have the same behavior, that they will refresh every 30 seconds. The very short ones, though, like the last five minutes or the last 10 minutes, you'll see that they actually refresh themselves every second. They kind of just scroll live as, as more data is coming in. There are also these ones. I haven't used these ones much myself, but I, you could imagine where these could be useful. These will show you a full, like today, but including the future. You know, so this is showing me today in my time zone, and it's including the the latter half of the day. Um, so if if you do have times where you just want to, you need to see what happened yesterday, what's happening this full week. These are quick buttons to do that. It's obviously also possible to just set a custom time range. One thing that I've noticed about this, I guess this falls into the, maybe the bucket of is this a bug or a feature. 
But I've, I've found setting, if I want to set a custom time range, I would suggest turning off the live mode first. If live mode is on and I change the custom range, it can sometimes try and realign the end for you. So like you've got say six hours set as your window, you move back to look at this um, you know, over the past month and it would automatically adjust the ending for you to keep it to that six hour window that you had selected. Um, I find that normally once I start selecting a custom range, I want to specify the, the full custom range. And so if, if it's not in live mode, it'll leave it alone and it'll, it'll do what I want. So now I'm looking at this over, you know, since early January through current. And it's kind of interesting. We, I and some folks from Cloud Health have been working on adding a lot more data to Wavefront in the past week or so. And certainly you can see that here as the, the data rate has taken a, a pretty sharp increase. Some, some things to highlight you notice that as I move around this chart, it's showing me this kind of little vertical bar highlighting the time that I'm currently looking at. And that little vertical bar is also being highlighted on all the other charts at the same time that are visible on my screen. Pretty simple, but can be helpful. You know, probably dashboards that you're creating are going to have logical groupings of charts together where data showing in one chart may be relevant to data in another. And so via this, you can kind of help you eyeball what's happening right now on this chart and at the same time on, on the other. Um, it's easy to move time around charts. So we already looked at how you can set the time for the whole dashboard at the top. Something that I find myself doing pretty frequently is to just use the, the little time pickers on an individual chart. If I click, say, eight days here, you're going to see two things happen. One is that this chart is now set to an eight-day view, which is a different time window to all the other charts on the dashboard. And I have two options. I can either reset this back to the original timeline, or I can push the time from this chart out to all the others. And this chart will remain fixed uh, until, I, until I tell it otherwise. So say I change this dashboard to look at just the last hour. All the other charts changed, but this one stayed fixed on, on what I had set. If I reset it, it'll go to the one hour time window that all the charts are on now or I can sync all the other charts to the time of this one. It's also easy, this is the thing that may be obvious, but if you've never done it before, it, it would not be discoverable. If you see something of interest and you wanna drill into it, just click and drag to do that. You'll see that it highlights the, the time as I'm, I'm holding down the mouse and, and dragging it'll sync onto that time period or it'll switch this chart to that time period and I can then sync all the charts to the same time period. We mentioned during the presentation about how you can hold down the shift key and it, it does a couple of things for you. One is if I'm not holding shift, you can see that the numbers in the legend here are things like 805,489. If I hold shift, I can see that the raw numbers are, you know, a little more uh, complicated with a lot of uh, decimal precision there. The other thing that holding shift will do is if I am holding shift and I click and drag, it will automatically sync all the charts to that time window. I, I personally don't find myself doing that very often or needing to remember that because drilling in and then just clicking the sync time option doesn't take very long, but, but it's there. The other thing that is, can be handy, and actually I remember 
showing this to a, a long time Wavefront, like Wavefront employee and Wavefront user recently, and they just never been aware of this. So there obviously are little um, tips and things you can do here that are, are not known to everyone, but as well as clicking and dragging to, to drill into a time period, you can also click and drag the time window at the bottom. So if you're looking at something and you know that ah, probably the, the error happened just outside this time window, you can just click and drag and, and move over to that time window. While we're talking about the, the um, ability to you know, have these hotkeys and, and key keyboard things to, to make changes. I'll just highlight the others. So I can hold, I'm on a Mac, so I'm holding command. I actually do have a control key. And I see that even on a Mac, if you have a control key, it'll, it'll work as well. It, this is making the legend not appear. So if the legend is getting in my way, I can just hold command on and it won't appear. The other way that we can do this, this is new with this uh, V2 UI that, that we're looking at here. You'll see that the legend as I'm hovering over it says press shift P to pin. So if I do that, the legend becomes this movable thing that I can move out of my way and put wherever I want and dismiss by closing it when I'm done with it. One thing that I want out of this myself, which is not implemented yet, but would be useful, I think, is the ability to then copy and paste from this legend. So currently, you can move it, but you can't copy and paste from it. Let me show the other thing that command clicking can be useful for. Two hours. There's a pretty useful concept here where if you see how as I'm looking at this chart, it's highlighting the series that I'm hovering over. If I click that series, it will highlight the same source on any other charts that are that have data from that same source. So I can see the same thing highlighted in other places. This can be pretty handy to see relations between things. And you can see the, the highlighted source in this list below. If I wanted to include more high things in the highlighting, it's very much like working with a, you know, a finder in a file system and you wanna select multiple files, just command click and that will select multiple of these series. And then you can dismiss the, either all of them in one go or individual ones from the list below. Okay, give me a second here. I just wanna make sure if there was anything else I want to show you that I have, may have missed. Okay, a few other things to show just at the top menu. One is this time zone picker. So by default, Wavefront is gonna show you data in your time zone, which frankly makes sense. Normally that is what you wanna look at. Um, if you do have a preferred time zone that you always want to see, that is an option that you can set on an individual basis under your profile settings. Where, where the, the standard default of seeing your time zone can sometimes throw you off is when you are working with a colleague, colleague is in a different time zone, they send you a, a link to a chart and they say, hey, you see this weird thing happening at 3 p.m. and it's not showing at 3 p.m. to you. So it can be pretty handy if you know your colleagues in this time zone X, just come in here and set the time zone to that temporarily so that you and your colleague are on the same page while, while you're working together on the problem. In terms of linking, the which is where you're probably gonna get this interaction with colleagues going, 
quickest way to do it is just anytime you're looking at a dashboard or a chart, you're going to see this little link icon in the bottom right. Click it to grab a short link to that data. Sometimes, most of the time, you want this link, I think. This is going to show your, whoever opens this link is going to see this data at this time period. If you do ever want to get a, a link to the live data, um, if, for instance, you're trying to show someone, here's this useful dashboard, and they, they want to open it live at any time, you can click here to copy link to a live display. It ran. It says on master. Yeah, it found it on master Probably and it didn't find on. any branches. I think somebody Shouldn't needs to that. mute. Sean, we can hear you talking. That's Becky. It's our deployment. That's oh. every time we deploy that. Keith, gonna happen. can you mute yourself? I muted it, I think. They got him. <laughs> okay. One other thing just to mention here is this compare functionality. So if you remember from yesterday in the query language, there is a function that lets you lag data and compare it to arbitrary time windows. Like with lag, you can lag the data by 37 minutes or whatever if you had some specific reason for some specific time frame. There is at the top of any dashboard though or any chart, just a quick way to do this if you need. Um, compare, like say, to a day ago. Uh, it's more limited in that it doesn't give you the custom range here. It just gives you these pre-built options, but it's obviously a quick and easy way to do it. Uh, when you use it, it will show you the prior data with this kind of dashed line, and it will also highlight the prior data in the legend. So I can see that currently, at today, this thing is showing 1.5 million approximately, Today, at this same point in time, it was around 140K. That can be useful and good, good to know about. We're going to look at events more tomorrow. So I won't cover this now, but just to show you, you can also have pretty good control over which events you want to see and which charts on your dashboard. The way that the sharing works, by the way, um, which can be of interest when you're uh, if you ever want to make, say, custom links to a dashboard, everything in Wavefront is just encoded in the URL. Same is true of a dashboard or even a chart. And I've shown this a few times, but just to really make it clear, it, anytime you do want to see the detail of an individual chart on a dashboard, you get to it by just clicking the chart title. And the, the URL for a chart encodes everything, including the, the queries, the time range. And so all these short links are is simply sh literally short links to the URL. Uh, it does mean that if you ever want to make like, a, you know, say on a wiki page or something, you have maybe links to key dashboards or key components, you can set up those links and drill into exactly where, where you want to get to pretty easily. One more thing I want to highlight on this dashboard is that this is one of the pre-built ones. And actually, just to, to show it, on the dashboard organizer, you any dashboard that comes with Wavefront, like an out-of-the-box dashboard, will get this little uh, Wavefront icon next to it. The, one thing to remember about that that is different from others is that you cannot edit it. So we're going to look at how to edit dashboards next. Um, and normally, if I'm looking at a dashboard and I have the permissions to edit that dashboard, I would just click the little three dot ellipsis here. And this is where I would get my edit menu. I don't get that with the pre-built dashboards. And that's simply to allow us to make improvements to those dashboards without getting into some massive merge conflict of, of how to reconcile the changes we've made with changes that you've made. If you have um, dashboard, like pre-built ones, where you, you like some of the content and you want to use it, though, you certainly can. All you need to do is clone this a dashboard off then it becomes your own copy. Uh, when you do this, you give it your own name and your own URL to uniquely identify it compared to the, 
the original Wavefront URL, then that's your dashboard to edit and modify as you like and, and we won't touch it. Since we are going to be looking at editing dashboards next, I'll switch, and I can't edit this one, I'll switch to a different dashboard. There, there's a dashboard we'll use for a couple of purposes today. Um, I'll show you how you can do edits, but also this is where we will look at how you work with dashboard variables a little later on. I do obviously have it favorited, so I can reach it by just clicking here and, and clicking, but just for anyone that hasn't got it favorited, I'll show you how I would reach it otherwise, which is it, it is one of the ones that has been tagged with one of these tag paths. And so if I drill in here, it's dashboard variables is the one that I'm opening up. One other thing I wanted to highlight even before we start editing here is how any errors may appear to you. Just to force an error to happen, I'm going to remove the aggregation uh, here. This was a, a, a variable that had been set. When I did that change, I saw this little error icon appear in the top left of the chart. Obviously, it's expected in this case because I just kind of forced it to happen. But if you do have problems on your charts, this is where they will be highlighted to you. You can also have descriptions on any charts. Like so many things <laughs> around software development, people probably don't add as many descriptions to their charts as they, as they could or they should, a bit like uh, developers documenting their code, but they can be helpful. So if you have a description, it'll highlight here. And in this case, the description is explaining, if you do see this error, here's the reason why and here's how you would fix it. I'm gonna just plop the average back on here. So as I said, editing dashboards uh, is done through this, this um, three buttons in the top right. You'll see a few things here. I'll, I'll maybe just show version history first. Um, anytime that you are modifying a dashboard in Wavefront, the same is true of alerts we automatically maintain a version history of the changes that were made. While you obviously may have key dashboards that you don't want people to, to modify, because it, you know, it may hinder you in the, if there's been a, a bad change made in the middle of you trying to uh, troubleshoot some incident. I would say though that th this version history helps to kind of relax that constraint. I mean, people, I would encourage users not to be worried about trying things out, make changes. You, you don't have to feel scared that you're going to you know, wreck something that can never be fixed. Even if you screw something up, you can get back to the previous one really easily. Uh, this is showing all the, the edits that have been made to this dashboard. In this case, the user is a little cryptic because this is the, the internal Wavefront user. But for your own dashboards, you're gonna see, you know, actual cloud health users that you may know and recognize their names and know who to reach out to about certain changes. Uh, it also shows you what changes were made and at what time. It's easy to both revert to a prior change and even clone off a new version. So if you, if you want the old version back, but the new version is useful for a different reason, you can clone off a copy and, and, and have them independent from that point. If you're not sure if you want to revert or clone off, you don't have to do it in order to see what the dashboard looked like at that point in time. You can just click any of the versions and see what was the dashboard back then and use that to drive your decision of whether you need to revert to it or not. For actually editing dashboards, just click here and click edit. This is going to put the dashboard into full edit mode. We're gonna look at the variables more uh, a little later, but just to highlight, if you want to reorder them, it's simple in case of just clicking and dragging to move them around. And if you want to remove them, this is where you do it and you, you add them from here. All dashboard content in Wavefront is backed by JSON. You 
can see the JSON here from the UI. There have been times when I've used this. So Cloud Health is using this extensively, of course, because you are attempting to migrate some dashboards from Datadog into Wavefront. You are using, and I believe also improving, a tool that, that we have that helps do that conversion process. Obviously, you, you can programmatically create dashboard JSON and you can uh, post it out to Wavefront to either create new dashboards or update dashboards. From time to time, I have used it even within the UI. If I'm, if I'm trying to make some mass edit, it can be easier to do it via JSON than pointing and clicking a whole lot. And, and so I highlight it to you. Uh, our customers have programmatically created, it depends on the customer, but quite a number have programmatically created dashboards and alerts uh, quite a bit, you know, really automate the process of we are creating a new service and we're automatically generating the relevant dashboards and alerts for that service. And you can use tools like Terraform or your, your kind of CI tools of choice to, to do all, all that kind of work. What, editing dashboards on the UI is pretty easy, pretty point and click, but I will highlight a few, a few things that are interesting about it. Um, making a new chart, if I want to add a new one to the dashboard, I kind of have two options. The, the metrics way is trying to simplify my life if it can. It's going to let me search for the metrics or search for the integration that uh, the data is coming from. If I kind of know what I want already and I know I'm going to just be typing the queries to add it, you can just use the chart type. And you, this is just a quick way to just get into the type of chart you want and start entering your own queries. When you already have charts on your dashboard, it's just a matter of clicking and dragging to move them around. Once you know, it, it's easy to do, but it is perhaps not immediate, necessarily immediately obvious that you can click and drag. The system will do its best to try and align charts if it can. Um, so if I click and drag a chart from one row into another, it'll try and snap the, the charts together. And this is most useful when your charts are all um, the same height as one another. You can see that on this dashboard, there were different charts of different heights. And this is allowing you to build more complex uh, arrangements where you have a whole, you know, three or four boxes on the right hand side, one big chart on the left and, and so on. If you have more complex stuff like that, you may need to use the little click and drag thing to adjust exactly the, the size and shape that you want your chart to be. Um, charts, when you're dragging them side by side, you can have up to 12 side by side. So you can have pretty dense looking dashboards in that way. This is something that we are actively working on and improving. Again, the V2 UI is fairly recent. Pre-V2, all Wavefront charts in a row had to be the same height. So we didn't, if I go back to how this was originally, we didn't have the ability to have like two charts in this row, whereas do with just one on this row. So the editor for manipulating them and dragging and dropping them has completely changed and is continuing to get refined and improved over, over the next couple of releases. But hopefully you find it works reasonably okay and, and it's fairly straightforward to use. Oh, one thing I forgot to show there actually. If you, very easy to modify um, section names, but just in case it's not immediately obvious, if you want to edit it, you just click its name and type away, change it. From here, you can also move the ordering of any sections and you can also remove the section altogether if you want to get rid of it. So I'll pause there. Any, any questions about either working with dashboards in general or editing dashboards or, or anything like that?
Okay, so we will move on to charts. So the, the timing of this is pretty interesting. Currently, Wavefront offers seven chart types. We are trying to rapidly expand that list. We're actually adding two more. There was a chance that the two more, like that the release with those would have been rolled out to you already by the time we did this training. It, it has not quite come out. It may be, it may be next week actually that it, that it ships. But since it's so close, I'll, I'll highlight what the new ones are. They actually do exist today already as um, examples. So I am looking at the, the Cloud Health tenant here to show these. Um, if you really want, I, well, since the release is coming next week, I wouldn't bother. But it is possible to create these chart types today by editing the JSON. We just haven't yet shipped the editors, the UI editors for making these charts. One of them is this node map, which is pretty nice. Um, it lets you look at a bunch of different metrics at once. So this is currently looking, I think, at CPU, but I can switch it to different metrics. Uh, the different metrics that you're looking at can have different thresholds for when, you know, when to show something as red or, or different colors. So it can be a quick way of highlighting um, bad things in your system. It also lets you group by um, tags that are on the data. So this is one of, this is a place where you have got all your AWS tags coming in on the data. So I can group by the Cloud Health function here, uh, which is pretty nice. This chart type also supports drill in. So if I hover over any of the nodes, it'll show me a little um, graphic of what's going on with that node, but also let me click and drill into more detail about that thing. The other new chart type that is coming is this top K chart. So this is kind of like a, a table chart, uh, only visually showing what are the biggest or smallest things in the list, which also lets you easily drill in and click to, to drill into that chart. These are, I think, both pretty nice new chart types that I hope you will find useful coming very soon. And our goal is to continue the, the pipeline with that and have more chart types coming over time. I also noticed, so this is a, the draft doc for that release, which is coming in the next week or so. I looked at this myself this morning and thought it would be worth sharing because there's a lot of nice improvements, not just in those chart types, but, but other improvements in general. So you will now be able to easily pull in content from uh, Wavefront pre-built dashboards into your own dashboards. So if there's a few charts from, from like a Wavefront dashboard that you want to incorporate into your own, that we're making that easier to do. There is uh, an undo feature. I have wanted this myself quite often where you, you've made some changes to a dashboard, you want to go back, you'll be able to do that now. There's this new concept of global filters um, this will allow you to, we're going to look at dashboard variables um, shortly. Dashboard variables allow you to kind of pre-configure the, the, how a dashboard can be customized by the users of that dashboard. Sometimes though, you, maybe you didn't think ahead of time to set up a variable in a particular way and you have this quick need to like, oh, for this dashboard, just show me the data for this source. I want to filter it onto that quickly. This global filter is a way of letting you do that without having to um, modify the dashboard variables. That's pretty nice. We are adding drill down to all chart types. So in, in the wavefront that you have deployed to Cloud Health today, uh, you can set up drill down links that go from one dashboard to another on single stat charts. So the single stats are these big number charts. So I could click say on this CPU chart here and be taken to a page showing detailed stats of, of all CPU usage versus the, the overall average. And that ability to drill down is being added to every chart type. So that will be pretty useful, I think. And then of course these uh, 
top K and node map charts that I, I showed you. Hopefully you will find those useful. One thing just to mention, or go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I was gonna say absolutely. We use those uh, those chart types currently. So uh, yeah, it'd be great to be able to recreate them. Uh, yeah, and if there are others missing, um, let us know. The, the other ones that you depend on a lot as we're, we are trying to continue to keep adding more and more. One thing, I guess we've kind of seen this, but just may bear repeating. You, you don't have to have a chart on a dashboard in order to use it or send someone a link to it. You know, I can just make a, a blank chart. I can do some stuff in here, whatever it is. And if, th if this is something interesting, I can grab a link to it. I can s share that link to someone not even associated with a dashboard. And you could even like bookmark charts or in your, either your browser or on a wiki page or whatever. This is also a mechanism by which you could get your chart into a dashboard. So you set something up and if you do want it to be in a persistent dashboard, you can save it from here. Um, I, I think actually that the ability to quickly do kind of ad hoc analysis of your data and run custom queries and ask um, custom questions of your data during a firefight is one of the really strong aspects of the Wavefront UI. You know, every product has dashboards um, and they all have their strengths and weaknesses. I think quick on the fly charting is a real strength of Wavefront. In fact, I remember being at a large customer of ours who was using Graphite and Grafana before uh, Wavefront, and I'm sure many of you have used Grafana before, which itself is a pretty nice dashboarding tool and has loads of chart types. Wavefront being a, an open system, everything API driven, we have a Grafana data source. So if you wanna use Grafana on top of Wavefront, you can do so. That customer does that. So that, that customer has a lot of dashboards still in Grafana because they were so used to it. And they were asked, I remember, you know, what if you have Grafana, what do you use the Wavefront UI for? And quick as a flash, the customer didn't even have to think about it. The customer said, everybody in our company has this blank chart bookmarked. And whenever we want to just ask a quick question of our systems, not related to a dashboard, it's just a, an ad hoc query, this is where we come to do it because this is so much faster at doing that kind of work than Grafana is. But they liked Grafana for all the different chart types that it offers and, uh, and so on. Similarly to the dashboards, I'm not gonna go through this here. It is more in the, the presentation content for you to be able to refer back to later. Um, but we will be looking at, at aspects of this as we go through and, and have done so already. The chart configuration is all below the chart. A lot of it is fairly self-explanatory, hopefully, but I will go through some of it to, to show some things that you can do. Ah, this is interesting. This is something that we haven't discussed yet and is definitely worth understanding. So, and I'm not sure how other tools deal with this, but it is just a fundamental thing that, that any time series tool is gonna have to have some approach to this issue. Um, if I'm looking at a bunch, if I'm looking at data over a wide time window, then there may be more physical data points that were sent into the system than there are pixels on my screen. You know, depending on the size of my monitor, the size of the, the window that I've put Wavefront in, I have a certain amount of just physical pixels with which to render that data. If the physical pixels is more than the underlying data points, then no problem, I can just graph each and every data point on my chart. But if I'm looking at a larger time window, it may very well be the case that there's more data 
than I can display all of. And so the system has to roll that up in some way. The way that Wavefront approaches this is to just show you the most fine-grained detail it can at any point in time. We have a little heuristic built in. I think it may be like four pixels. There's something like we're, we're assuming that if, the, if individual data points were closer than, say, four pixels apart, the human eye wouldn't really be able to distinguish between them as, say, the line was spiking up and down. So we know how many pixels we have to work with, with that heuristic in mind. When the front end runs a query, it tells the back end, or when it wants a query to be run, it tells the back end, run this query and give me the, data, the answer back bucketed into this many data points, because that's how many points I have to physically plot on the, on the chart. And by default, it's going to do any aggregation of those data points by just averaging them together. So it, the, the front end said, give me this data back in 10 data points. If there's more than one real data point within each of those buckets, the back end will average them up and return that to the front end. You can switch this on a per chart basis from the average to something else. What this is showing you is an estimate. I think this is the most useful one to look at. If you're ever, if you're ever confused about wh what the data is showing to you, if you just look below the chart, you'll see that in this case, it's saying each physical point that the, the UI is rendering is representative of 12 seconds worth of data. If there are more than one data point, if, if you're reporting data faster than every 12 seconds, then in this case, there would be some grouping of the data points going on. And just to show how this would work. So I, as I said, you, by default, this is going to be the average. The, the idea here is we're looking at a chart where we had six physical data points that were reported for the data, five, 23, and so on. Um, the data is being reported every 10 seconds. And we are looking at a chart where each physical point on the screen is representative of 60 seconds. And therefore, that, therefore each uh, point on the screen has to combine all these values in some way. And you can kind of just see how that would work. The average is, you, of course, you add them all up, divide by six. The smallest one is five. The biggest one is 182. The count of them in this case is six. The first one is five, last one is 10. So hopefully that makes sense. And I'll, when I, I go into the product here, I'll point out below the chart where you see this information. So let's take a look. I'll go back to this same request latency data just to show you. Um, I'll, sh I'll show a few things. Like I'll, sh I'll show some examples of how you, um, special configuration that you have for different chart types. And just to wrap up on that topic of bucketing, currently I'm looking at two hours and based on my screen resolution, every data point on the screen is representative of 15 seconds approximately of real world data. But as I zoom out, you'll see that number is increasing because there's just way more real data points under the covers. And so the, the time window of the bucket increases. Uh, does that make sense? Let me know if, if anyone has questions about that. It's a little tricky when, when you first hear of it, but it is kind of a, a key concept. Okay, here is where you configure it, by the way. So this is where it's defaulting the summarization strategy to average, but you could pick any of those other options. The axis is going to be pretty common across most chart types. You have the option of switching between a linear and log view. I haven't used the log view all that much myself, but and I guess it's actually really not needed in this case, but it can be helpful when you're looking at data that is of very different scale from one another. 
the, the log view can help you see how that data is changing. You can set up min and max on your charts. So if you know you're looking at, say, percentage, you might set this to be between one or zero and 100 so that you're always looking in that range. You get the option of having two axes. So that's what, what secondary min means in this case. This allows you to have, if I have two, if I have two or more charts on, or two or more queries on a chart, I can flip which axis I want any individual query to be visible on. And that's why the axis settings let you configure both. Most of the options here are pretty self-explanatory, but <coughs> one may be worth mentioning is for various types of things like timing, um, the kind of data that you'd get from machines like tr you know, bytes transmitted or size of a disk and things like that. The system kind of knows about those concepts. And if you wish to, you can pick one of them and set the dynamic units option. What that's gonna do is it'll try and just scale the data into a human readable value. So if you know that you're looking at latency data and it, you know that it's in milliseconds, if you select that and set here to milliseconds, instead of the chart showing you some number that looks pretty cryptic like 60,000 or whatever, that's gonna show you instead one minute and, and just scale that to values that the system thinks were going to make sense to a, a human user looking at. We have looked a lot during the course of this training at this hover legend. Uh, hover legend works well when you are interacting with the system. You know, you're looking at charts or dashboards on your own device, your laptop or whatever. Um, Obviously, that hover legend doesn't work so well if you, let's like, say, have a, a big you know, a big monitor in the office showing dashboards or something like that. For those kind of cases, you can have fixed legends. These will just show you what's happening on the, on the chart and the colors and the keys at, at any given time. And various options for how you configure that thing. Description, self-explanatory, but if you remember, this is the place where if you provide it, you will get uh, the description highlighted to the user if, if they hover over this chart on a dashboard. It can actually be pretty helpful to the end users of these things if you put meaningful descriptions in here. One final concept that is worth mentioning on charts in, in a general sense, uh, which hasn't come up yet in the training, is this concept of obsolete metrics. This I think it will come up with Cloud Health in that I believe that Cloud Health refreshes its machines pretty frequently. So you get new sources every day. And so over time, Wavefront will treat the older data as what it calls obsolete. This works on a four week window. So you've seen throughout this how Wavefront is letting you search for metric names, autocomplete tag and tag values. All of that auto completion and so on is facilitated by us maintaining indexes or indices of all the data that we're seeing under the covers. Any time series that comes into the system will be retained in those indices for at least four weeks. If the time series continuously reports, like if you had some physical host that's reporting data and it, you know, it stays around for months or years, then it's always reporting data and that series will never become obsolete because it's all, it'll always be kept in the indexes and I could look at data from that thing from two years back and see it and it would appear without me having to do anything. But if I've got data that stops reporting, like because the, the source machine changed or the, the point tag values changed or even the metric names changed, then after four weeks, because they have not, those series have not reported any new values, they will become obsolete. We don't remove them from the system, they're still there, but if you want to view that data, you would have to check this 
button on. The only reason why we have this and why it's an optional setting that is defaulted to off is querying for that data in just requires us to look for the data outside of the indices, which is a little slower. So we have it defaulted to off just to help performance for most queries because you know most queries in a time series system like this are generally looking at data either from today in the last week or in the last month so you don't need this often but it's a good thing to remember if you're ever looking at older data and you expect it to be there but you can't see it this is you know eight times out of ten this is the reason uh, come and check this box and you'll see the data you're looking for Any questions about that? Okay. Some of these, many of these um, chart types are very similar to one another in terms of the options, so I won't show all of them. Some of them are pretty cool, like stacked column is a nice chart, I think. Table chart has some custom options um, defining like whether you want the metric name to appear in the list. The, the and actually this one came up yesterday where you can show the the raw values in a table chart without any of the summarization. So you can see when I click click that on, I get the the big number shown as the value. One that is pretty useful. I wonder if I actually have, I can show you an example of this real quick. In this chart, I now have two different kinds of data. I have the latency data and I have the total requests data. Both of these are coming from the same source. So the sources are all these app things in both cases. When I check on the group by source option, you see that it looks for the sources that match and it shows their values side by side in the columns. This is a way if you're trying to look at a whole bunch of data from systems in one go, you can show a whole bunch of values side by side like this. Uh, and it, the, the way to do that is behind the group by source option. You see that when it's off, I'm getting those things listed as separate individual things as opposed to multiple columns on the same chart. Markdown is pretty self-explanatory but can be helpful I think. This is you know literally regular markdown you can put images in here, uh, descriptive content of what the dashboard's all about, what it's used for, links to either other Wavefront dashboards or even other systems that, that you use. Um, so simple, but, but can be very useful. And finally, single stat is that just big number chart. Actually, in order to show this, I may just put some fake number in here that I can change around to see how the colors change. There's a couple of things that you can do with these big number widgets. They're definitely very much intended for showing only one thing, of course. So you either have a query that gives you one time series, or you would have an aggregation like average to take a bunch of time series and turn it into one value. It's going to show you by default whatever the value is, the right-hand side of the chart window that you're looking at. You can customize that using the query language itself. Like if you wanted to look at the value at the left-hand side, you could say at start or moving min over the, the time window or whatever query makes sense for what you're trying to do. You can do a couple of things which, with this, which is both adjust the text that appears and adjust the color. So sometimes you may not actually want to show the value. You might just want to show something like this is good or this is bad or green or whatever. So if you want to set a mapping of how the values map to the text, you can do so here. So I'm going to say like between 1 and 15. I'm, I'll call this one, let's say, bad. This one, okay. 
this one good. So now if I go back to my data, if I change it to zero, which is below one, it's saying bad. Anything between one and 15 should be okay. And anything above 15 should be good. So they're pretty simple to set up. And same, very similar concept for on the Sparkline tab for marking or changing how the colors map or how the values map to the colors. You can choose to either um, apply the color to the background of the chart or the text of the chart. I'm going to pick background here and I'm going to set up something very similar to what I had before where let's say red is the bad one, green is the good one. And currently we're at 16, so it's green. If I put it to zero, which is below the one mapping that I set up, it turns red. On this chart, in again, this is gonna, we're gonna see this option on all charts in the next week or so. But in the current release that's on Cloud Health here, um, just these single stat panels have this drill down link option. The drill down link lets you set up which dashboard you want to link to, and it lets you pass dashboard variables and content from this dashboard and this chart over into the, the, the target dashboard. This is pretty cool, lets you m m set up much more um, dynamic hierarchies of, of dashboards and information to help people diagnose and troubleshoot issues more quickly. I haven't played with this much myself yet since it's so new, but it looks fairly straightforward. I'm picking here either dashboard variable values, which are variables that are applying to the whole dashboard, or I'm picking values out of the current chart that we're looking at, like the, the value of the source that this current chart is looking at, as an example. And it looks like I can do multiple of those. Okay, any questions about charts or? I am curious, again, let, let us know offline other chart types that you're, you're using today in Datadog and, and things that you're looking for. Okay, I'm gonna move on to dashboard variables. Pretty, pretty standard concept to have these. Um, I think I've seen cases where Cloud Health users are already making use of this and already making dashboards that are using these, but hopefully helpful to go over the concepts here. The, the way these basically work is you define a variable at the top of a dashboard and you give it a variable name and you, the, the selection that a user makes of that variable can then be accessed by any charts by referring to it with, this is how you do it in the query, it's dollar sign, curly brace, and then the name of the variable. If you remember from yesterday, this is exactly the same syntax that is used for query line variables. So you can, you can name your queries in your wavefront charts from, with it, from other query lines on the same chart you can refer to those named queries that you created. So those are sort of variables that have chart level scoping, if you will. The way that you refer to the values of dashboard variables is exactly the same way. It's simply that they have dashboard level scoping as opposed to chart level scoping. There are three types of dashboard variables. The first one is called simple. This is perhaps a bit of a funny name. This is certainly the simplest for the dashboard author to create, but it's probably the hardest one for a user of the dashboard to use. This is the kind like where I edited 
the, the aggregation variable earlier to cause the error to appear on the chart. Simple is just literally there's a text box and you type into the text box whatever you want and that the text that you supply is then just provided in the in the variable to be used in a chart. Um, very simple just to create one but it can be hard for a user because it doesn't do any auto completion or anything. It, it's, it, the user really has to know exactly what to put in there. The next one is a simple list. I, I mean, the next two are, are very similar to one another from a user standpoint. They're just those drop downs. You, you click the drop down and you either select the thing that you're looking for or you type to filter it down and search for the thing that you're looking for. The only difference is how does the dashboard author define them. List is where the dashboard author is just manually or statically saying, these are the three or four or five options that I want to appear in the dropdown and you configure what does the user see in the dropdown and what gets, if the user selects that value, what will get passed to the variable. Um, like it says here, it's good for options that don't change that often. Um, it's also good or can be used to do some really powerful stuff in that the, the replacement can be anything. The replacement can even be a wavefront query. But I don't know if you remember on day one, we looked at this demo where I saw a bunch of data and I selected from a dashboard variable to correlate that data. Under the covers, this was how the, that was done. The, when the user selects correlate from the dropdown, so very simple for the user to click, but under the covers, the dashboard is then uh, running a, a more complex correlation query based on the, how the list variable is defined to render the results to the user. So kind of an advanced use case, but it can be used to set up really uh, advanced and, and powerful and useful dashboards. And then the final one is the dynamic list. This is probably the one that gets used the most often. Um, it, it lets you define what will populate the drop-down list um, via a query. And it's probably the most used because this is, and it, the clue is in the name, as your data actually changes, as you add more sources or different values of point tags, the drop-down will just show the, the, the newer values without any user having to go and configure anything. So let's take a look at some examples of those. I'm gonna go back to that, this training dashboard and we'll, I'll show you how that works. Actually, just while I'm here, I'll show one other thing which I forgot to mention. You know how we were looking earlier, how you, the way you edit a dashboard generally is you put it into edit mode. I'm gonna do that in a second to look at these variables and see how they're defined. If you do ever wanna just make a quick change to a single chart on a dashboard though, you don't need to put it in edit mode. Edit mode is needed if you're trying to move the order of charts, delete charts, add new charts. If you just wanna like change the units of this one, in fact, I can see here it just says units instead of, you know, perhaps this is milliseconds. So I make the change, the units on the top left change to say milliseconds. I can now just save this back to the dashboard that I'm looking at, or if I wanted to insert it to a, a new or different dashboard, I don't even need to put the dashboard into edit mode to do that. On the chart that you were on, Connor, if say I wanted to take a look at that latency graph there, but I wanted to show it um, by each host in the latency, yeah. What would the modification need to be to, to do that? So in this case, the modification would be literally just to take off all the queries because in oh, this- the aggregator, okay, yeah, I got it. In this case, there is each, and this is again, it's just sample data, just demo data, but each individual source is just reporting its own latency as one thing. But you could imagine a case where uh, each source 
say say you were trying to do something like each source is emitting um, the count of how many response codes it saw. And it, it's got a di an individual count for how many 200s, how many 400s, how many 500s. In that case, you would need to sum them, sum them up, you know, like to act, get the total number of uh, requests that were made. Or, to, or and then you would do you would do a group by, but you would group by the sources. Does that make sense? So right. in this case, it's not needed because each individual source is only one line anyway. But if in your data each individual source is emitting multiple lines, <laughs> then you aggregate it and you break out that aggregation by the sources reporting it. Okay. So, but, I mean, so that shows me the average. What if I wanted to see the max for all of them divided by sources? Like that's a different the, comma sources. Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, right. that's right. Thanks. And then even this is where you would potentially start chaining functions together. Like this is showing the max for each source at any given time. If you wanted to know like, what was the max for each source over the past two hours? Then you can chain it together like that. Okay. Let's can go back I, and can I, can I ask yeah. another dashboard question? I, I, one yeah. of the things I use in Datadog is like I'll pick that that graph right there, and I want to expand it to zoom in. Is mm -hmm. editing it the only way that I could see it, kind of in a bigger window? It is currently yes. Um, it's a good question and, and a, I think a very reasonable potential feature request to, to do that differently. You do have to drill into it to see it a bit bigger and you don't obviously you don't have to edit it. You don't have to change anything, but right. yeah, this is the, the way that you would look okay. at it. Okay. Yeah. I missed that. Okay. So I put this back in edit mode to look at these variables. So we'll, we'll go in order. The simple one is this aggregation. Couldn't be simpler in terms of setting it up. You just, you give the name of the variable that you want. Then when you're writing queries on this dashboard, again, the way you're gonna to refer to this or refer to any of them is by the the dollar curly and then the name that you specify here. This will be auto completed for you. So it, it's actually, uh, obviously you have to remember the dollar curly part of it, but once you've remembered that, you don't even really need to remember the variable names much. They'll just auto complete. The dis I'll actually show this. The display name is just, if you want the internal variable name to be different from what the, the human reader or human user will see. You can make these different. Uh, all of them have this ability to hide when not in edit mode. This can be useful sometimes. Like say, say I wanted, I, I needed some shared queries. Like I, I wanted to reuse a query on multiple charts throughout this dashboard. I could encode the query here. Some could be some long, powerful string of things to computing something. And I could mark that it would be hidden to the user when the dashboard's not being edited. And then all of the charts in my dashboard could reuse that query, kind of like a global variable, but it wouldn't get in the user's way when they're interacting with the dashboard and selecting things from the dropdowns. I would think that would be most useful uh, on a simple variable like this, but this option is available on all variable types. This one is, I believe, the list type. So pretty straightforward. Um, you can drag and drop to change the ordering that you want these to appear in. Again, the, it's a bit like how you have the, the like internal variable name versus the human readable name. The left-hand side of this is what do you want to appear in the dropdown for the user to see? And the right-hand side is what do you want to send to the underlying query when the user makes that selection. There are definitely times when these are gonna match one-to-one, -one, but there are also times where it may be a little different. You want a friendlier user-facing string perhaps than the, the internal one. And certainly in the case I described where those things are 
oh, that was weird. I wonder if that's a glitch in the V2 UI or something. Um, there are cases where you might want those things to be uh, like replacing with a, a query or something. And obviously you don't want the user to have to select the query. And the final type is the dynamic type. These are, prob again, probably the most heavily used. They're probably the most complicated to set up from a dashboard authoring standpoint, but hopefully they're not too bad. Um, a lot of the similar concepts, like what's the variable name going to be, the difference is that when you select the dynamic variable type, you have these options that appear of what is the query that you want to run in order to generate that tag? And what do you want to extract from that query in order to drive the dropdown list? So you can see here that the, this query is um, selecting the source and therefore the list that's going to be displayed to the user is the list of sources matching that query. And a useful thing that you see here that is very common is you see how this query is actually referring to the selection from a previous variable. So you, it's quite common to see kind of chains of these things. Like first of all, the user selects the data center and then they select the cluster, but the cluster, the list of values in the cluster is only going to show them valid ones in the data sec data center that had previously been selected. And then you can, you know, I've seen sometimes two, three, four of these kind of chaining things where the final drop down is selecting like the one, uh, the one host or whatever, but from a pretty short list of, of legal values once you've got to that point. So hopefully that makes sense. And there's an example of that right here of how this is a, another dashboard variable where the user has selected something and that constrains the, the list as query returns. You can pick other options. I think the one that I see most commonly is either source or point tag. Um, actually, let me take off environment on here because I know then there is this environment point tag. This is, I'm running the query, TS sample request latency. I want the user to se select from some values of a tag and the I'm, I name the point tag key that I want the values to, to come from and it's showing point tag here. This is a place where I didn't show this function yesterday. I'll show it briefly here and you can look at the, the documentation if you need to do this in, for real in future or just ask me if you want help with it, I can show you. But there's, I mentioned that there are these metadata functions that can do things like renaming uh, metrics or sources or tags on the fly or even adding new tags on the fly. Like I think that in some of the sample data, maybe the memory one, we had apps and DBs. So what I'm going to do here is this data I know has sources that I think begin with app dash something or DB dash something. Maybe I want the user to be able to select from the apps or the DBs, but I don't have a tag for like function or role or something like that. But I can make it on the fly. So I can say I want to create a tag on this data. I want to extract it from the source. I want to split the string or split the source on the dash character. And then I want to extract the zeroth element from that thing. And I want to call that dynamically created tag role. So now if I select the role point tag here, I can pick between app and DB. If you have more complex use cases, like the usual way to use Tagify, which I certainly I've used the most frequently, is you just split on some character and then you say, what, what element of that do I want to extract from? If this is a string, 
it is a regular expression though or treat it as a regular expression. So you can actually go to Torn with this if you want to and, and extract data in, in arbitrary ways fr from your, your metrics, your sources. Even you can extract a, another tag from an existing uh, point tag. It, it's very flexible. Okay. There are a few links here. Th this um, this is linking you, if you want to look at it after the fact, back to that same training dashboard. This is showing how the queries are actually used. So we just looked at how to set up the, the variables themselves. This is showing how the queries in the charts actually refer to those variables. Again, it's always just uh, dollar, curly, and then the variable name. Um, and it's and it's hopefully fairly self-explanatory. Like if you set up a dynamic variable to give the user a list of sources to pick from, then the query that you're going to use will have source equals and then the variable name, and this will just replace this part with whatever the user selected. There's a few very common use cases um, with dashboard variables that we'll just briefly review here. I think actually we've shown a couple of these already. Maybe just this middle one of setting uh, an all option has not been seen, but we'll, we'll go through. So this is what we were just discussing with the fact that one, var one variable can refer to the setting from another variable. This is allowing you to chain variables together to further constrain the user selection as they're picking things. Pretty, pretty simple, but very useful. This one is a little, like, frankly, this is a workaround. There is a, a, an open ticket to make this thing be just a very simple point and click uh, kind of concept, but there's not, this isn't point and click today, but there is a way to do it. If you, th if you think back to what I was just showing where I, you know, I, I can pick the, from one of the sources here. So I have this query, it populates a list of sources, the user picks one of them. Perfectly fine, works well. But what if I wanna set this up so that the user can either choose to look at all of them at once or if they don't want to look at all of them, pick one to look at. I don't actually have a, like a checkbox to add an option like all into the list for the user to select from. Adding it as a checkbox is the feature request. The way to do it for right now is this function. You're, you're basically, it's basically adding a, a synthetic value for that tag as a wildcard and collecting all that data together. Um, I would just suggest if you need to do this, just open up this PowerPoint, copy paste it and, and try it out. Uh, it works, it's pretty simple, it works well, but this is a place where you could come and remember the way the query worked. And what it results in is that the user then, instead of just having dev and production, they'll also get a, a star option that they can pick from at the top. And the final use case here is an example of what I showed previously, where if you know that there's some useful data that you want the user to be able to select from, but you don't actually have it in a named point tag or something, it's like a piece of the metric name or a piece of the source or a piece of another, uh, of an existing tag, you can extract that data out and you can present it to the user in this way. Again, I wouldn't suggest or expect that you remember this, but if you ever do need to do something like this, this is a place where you could come back and refer to and kind of copy paste from here. We actually covered this already. Um, let me know if you have any questions either about variables or these concepts, versioning and, and tagging dashboards. We looked at this as we were going through it.
Okay. Otherwise, then I'm moving on to the, the final section for today, which is about access control to dashboards and this concept of orphaned dashboards. I, might, I mean, I may ask even just up, up front about the level, the, whether Cloud Health expects that they will use this. The idea here is that by default, if a user in Wavefront has the dashboard management permission, and currently the way that Cloud Health has set things up, all your users have this permission, it, then that, that user can edit any dashboard in the system, except for the, you know, the Wavefront out of the box ones. It is possible to limit that though. Like you can say that for these dashboards, only these users can edit them or this group, you can, you, you can categorize users into groups and assign permissions that way. Given the fact that Wavefront has um, version history of dashboards and so on, so that usually even if a user edits a dashboard and it's a bad edit, it's usually not catastrophic. You can just revert to the, to the good version. Um, this has not been used all that much, but I definitely have seen cases where, and the same concepts, by the way, apply to alerts. So you can do exactly the same kind of management of access control on both dashboards and alerts. I have seen this used more with alerts, frankly, where yes, I want to give users the alert management um, permission because I want them to be able to self-serve, create their own alerts that they think are useful for their, themselves. But I do have these like 100 core alerts that I use to monitor my business. And I only want people in the like observability team or the monitoring team or the, the team that's responsible for a particular service to be able to edit those alerts. Um, do you, do you know already whether you make use of this? I, I, I frankly don't know whether Datadog has a, a similar concept or not, or whether you're using it if it does. Up to this point, we haven't filtered any of the, uh, any of the dashboards or monitors. Um, occasionally we'll put them in kind of like read only mode, but that's been about it. Yeah. Okay. And actually you, you, the way you said that prompted me, you can also use this to limit who can view certain dashboards. I, I, I have seen that come up with some customers. As you can imagine, like now that, and maybe Cloud Health is gonna see the same thing. You're also part of VMware now. Um, VMware has a lot of traditional enterprise type customers those kind of traditional enterprises can sometimes be pretty focused on hierarchies and only certain users to be able to see certain things. And so you can set up that only people in this group can see this like sensitive dashboard or what have you. I frankly haven't seen much use for that in the kind of traditional Wavefront customer base. I mean, usually the whole idea of a tool like this is we want to be open to everyone. Sure each team should tag their own dashboards. That way it makes it very easy for members of that team to just quickly see their own stuff and not be bogged on in the list of other people's stuff. But it usually people want it to be open that if, if, I, if I'm curious and I wanna see what some other team is doing, I can do it, I can go search for it, I can find it. But if you wish to, you can, you can lock it all down. Um, In a similar vein, um, this is, I think, not going to be used by Cloud Health, but it, you know, for the sake of completeness, it, it will mention it and it's here. The default way that this behaves is kind of like, uh, in a way, like you would blacklist users that can't view it or can't edit it. Like by default, you cr a user creates a new dashboard, it's going to be viewable by all and it is going to be editable by anyone that has the dashboard permission. And in the case of Cloud Health, you have things currently configured so that every user has the dashboard permission. Um, if you wish to, you can flip the direction of this. So, and then, you know, 
in the blacklist mode, the dashboard author could, if they wanted to, go and restrict the access. You can flip that so that if you want the default behavior to be when a user creates a new dashboard, only they have access to it until they whitelist others that can view and modify, you can do that. I don't expect that Cloud Health will use this based on what you said, Scott, but you know, it, it's an option. You probably also won't fall into this if you're not using this feature, but again, just to, to show it's there. If, if you've got, say, uh, a user that had set up a dashboard that only they could view and only they could modify, and then they are no longer in the system for whatever reason, like you know, they moved to a different company or what have you, then that dashboard would become orphaned. You know, no, no one who was currently a user had the ability to even view that dashboard, let alone edit it. For that reason, we have this concept of super admin. Uh, a super admin user can see all, all dashboards, um, no matter the ALs where set to be, and the super admin can see and recover any orphaned dashboards if they exist. Um, again, in the, for the sake of completeness, it probably makes sense, Scott, that I would sync up with you offline and we can just set whoever are the right people to have the super admin access. We might as well do that because it is a, it's a concept that as Wavefront adds other features, there may be other capabilities that are given to the super admin user over time. And so we might as well have them set up to, a, to be appropriate people from the get-go. But we'll, we can sync up offline on that. Let me just show you how some of that works then. And actually, I'll mention something. So um, I'll mention a related thing here that came up yesterday. I hope I get the name right. I think I was working with Chris Boyle. I had shown him how you can make service accounts in Wavefront and you can then uh, assign permissions to those service accounts. And I actually made a change to your environment that kind of screwed him up a little bit, uh, which wasn't my intent. But I, I think we're back on a good place right now. But it'll give me the opportunity here to show how some of this is set up. I bet this is going to make me re-off again. Yes. OK, so <laughs> you'll get another quick preview of how the Wayfront team accesses tenants under the covers as I re-auth to this, so it lets me show these things. So as I just mentioned in the PowerPoint presentation, Wavefront has the concept of groups. Uh, groups were introduced relatively recently, and when we introduced that concept, we made the idea of an everyone group. The, every user in Wavefront belongs to this group, and you can assign permissions to it. If you do this, it means that should you wish to change those permissions later, you just edit them on the, you know, change the default set of permissions later. You just change the um, this list here. It applies to every user automatically. Very smooth, very easy. Prior to this, and I noticed that this is the change that I made. I noticed that Cloud Health, th that this cluster existed prior to that group concept being added. So previously, you could set what are the default permissions for new users. And this is where, in Cloud Health's case, this was, I won't go through it all, but this was set. All of them were on, basically, except for the accounts and groups permission. The and this works fine. All your, as a new user comes in, they get assigned these permissions, works. The only real drawback of it is that if you ever wanted to change the default set in future, and actually you might, like you may say, I don't want most users to be able to set up their own proxy because I want to manage who, you know, how the data gets into the system or, or what have you. Um, the disadvantage of having it on the default permissions is 
if you remove it from here, it will not assign it to any new user, but it won't go and yank the permission away from any existing user that already been assigned it. What I was not aware of, and the, what screwed the, the Cloud Health user up, is that when you create service accounts, these service accounts also are part of the everyone group and cannot be removed from it. So what I had done was I turned off your list of default permissions and made it blank and I assigned the same set to the everyone group. And my thinking there was new users will come in, they'll get the everyone group, they'll get the permissions. And in future, if you ever wanted to change them, it'd just be a little smoother because you change them on the everyone group and you don't have to go and individually update all the users. But where that messed up the service account was what the user is really trying to do with the service. This service account is for assigning source tags. And the intent is that this service account can only add source tags and nothing else. Um, but when it was part of the everyone group and I had given everyone all permissions, then this service account would inherit all those permissions and would have more permit, you know, a lot more permissions than what it's intended to have. So the way I resolved that is I just made a new default group for that new users will be assigned. That is called users. I assigned the, um, the, the, all the permissions to that group and the service account does not belong to that group. So the service account can be uh, individually managed and have its permissions individually managed. So hopefully that makes sense and it kind of shows you how Cloud Health is currently set up and gives you visibility of where you would change it if you ever do want to make changes to this. Also where if you ever did want to have like these alerts or these dashboards are key ones belonging to a certain team, how you could create a group for that team, assign users to it, and then uh, you could manage the ability to edit or view those alerts via that group. Uh, it's under this tab, security, where you have that. Again, I don't think Cloud Health will use this option or, or flip this option, but you could make it like dashboards are by default only accessible to the author of the dashboards. If you ever do want to modify permissions of dashboards, it is on the the dashboard organizer page where you would do that. It works pretty similarly to adding or removing tags in that you can uh, add additional groups to be able to edit it from here or you can um, remove them. So you, here you can see everyone group has access to this dashboard currently and that's the default. Uh, and of course you can do that by selecting multiple. The, if you, I would say, if you do use this feature, if you do want to make mass edits, you're selecting a bunch of stuff and you're doing it from here, uh, th this is the way to make those mass edits quickly. If you just want to do it on an individual dashboard though, probably an even easier way to do it is that under the sharing link of a dashboard, you have this accounts and groups tab. And from here, you could either like remove the everyone group or add, or add another an individual group like monitoring group and delete the everyone group or, or what have you. So pretty simple to use. Um, and I hope, you know, useful to be aware that it exists even if you don't necessarily use it yourself. Or use it much at least. Any questions about that? Okay. Oh, just one more little chart thing popped into my head. Um, I forgot to mention this earlier. I have not seen this feature used all that much, but I think it can be actually kind of useful. And so it may be worth at least showing that it exists. We're going to look at events tomorrow. Um, in more detail, but since we were, we were talking about charts and interacting with charts today, I'm just going to show this here. If you wish to, like obviously this is just a flat line, so it's not interesting, but if you wish to, say there was some event here, like 
weird thing happened at this point in the chart. I can just click and drag and create an event at that point in time. And I can say, you know, call it whatever I want. By default, it, the thing will automatically create a query for me that will show this event on the chart. NARS say, um, I want to get help from a colleague on, on this thing, and I send the link to them. They're going to see this, you know, they're going to see highlighted the section of the chart that I thought was interesting and that I, I wanted their opinion on. Um, so I think that actually can be quite useful, but I, I, I don't see a lot of customers using it. And therefore thought it'd be nice to just show it to you so you're aware. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, that's it for today's session. Thank you very much for your time and look forward to the final one tomorrow, which will be all around kind of monitoring use cases, alerting and so on. Uh, just like the other days, there will be some exercises. So I will paste the exercises into the chat. And when I get the recording later today, I'll paste the recording and the PowerPoint into the chat as well. I don't know if there is a question there. Hey, Connor. I, I, have, I do have a question for you, Connor. Uh, yeah. No, I hope you haven't covered this. Um, I sent you a link to a dashboard that I, I'm sure that only you and I will have access to. Um, <clears throat> there's Let me see if I'm logged some, in there right now. Okay, yeah, I can see it. Yeah, so on this dashboard, if you go down to the selected SDBC details section, there's a CPU use top 25 um, prior two hours chart yes. with a list of VMs. If you click one of those VMs, it hones the dashboards to the right in on whatever VM you clicked. Uh -huh. um, did you cover how that functionality works? Yes, but there is a caveat to it that I didn't mention. Um, functionality works only, and this is actually, to be honest, it's a limitation. This could be improved. But the functionality as it stands today, is limited to the metric. If you have individual sources sending data, then it, it works well. But where it, will, where it will not be so useful is if, if the thing that makes the, the data individual is actually like a point tag value or something. Um, if you want to use this capability where you have point tags, you may need to like rename the source. I, in fact, I might have even done that because I think I, I may have tweaked this dashboard. Yes, it's. You see how there's this. A, this was me. Yeah. This actually, see how there's this alias source in here. This yeah. is this is working around that limitation. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the VM name, and I'm naming the source as the VM name. Because that's the the unique thing here is the VM name tag, not the source itself. And so, by naming the source to be the VM name, it allows that feature to work. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Okay. So you so you might have other cases like that where you want to use this feature to work, and it and but it doesn't work like kind of out of the box. You may be able to work around the limitation in those cases by naming the source to be the thing that you want the selection to work off of. Got it. The other thing that I have not done yet, but I thought would be interesting, by the way, with this data and, rela and relating to what we, we looked at today, I showed that we have this drill-in capability now. Um, we could, and both on this dashboard, but you know any dashboard that you're creating, it might be nice to be able to like click these things and not only have them highlight things, but click and drill into more detail about what's going on with this particular VM. Like drill to a different dashboard with more information on it. Yeah, that'd be neat. All right, great. Um, I will stop the recording here.